So thank you all for joining us. My name is Nina Young, and I am the Director of Policy and Network at Coalition for Green Capital. Um, I want to uh, take the opportunity to briefly introduce our panelists for this afternoon. Um, we are all here today to talk about the various structures of green banks and how to establish them. And all of this being triggered by this once in a generation opportunity of the Inflation Reduction Act to get funds to catalyze uh, clean energy investments across the country. Um, so again, we have three panelists this afternoon. We have Duan Andrade, the Executive Director of the Solar Energy Loan Fund of Florida, also referred to as SELF. It is a community development financial institution and a green bank. We also have Stephen K. Brown. He's the founder and chairman of the Clean Energy Fund of Texas. And we have Paul Schaffenberger, the chief executive officer of the Clean Energy Fund, excuse me, the Colorado Clean Energy Fund. Um, so thank you all for, for joining us. Um, so I'm going to give um, a little bit of background information because I've met some of you, but I know this invite was forwarded to um, many people. So um, I'm going to give a quick quick background on the Coalition for Green Capital and kind of what has what has gotten here to, the, to this point. Oh, and we have been joined by my colleague, Henry Lippman, whom I'm also going to add a pin. Um, and Henry is the Senior Director of uh, Coalition for Green Capital. And at a point, he will speak to um, some of our work with our partners in New Mexico. They are deep in the legislative process right now, and he participated in a hearing this week to support the Green Bank legislation uh, for the state of New Mexico. So thank you again all for joining. Um, all right, so uh, the Coalition for Green Capital has been around for about 14 years to support the expansion of clean energy investments across the country. And as I just mentioned, the Inflation Reduction Act is an unprecedented opportunity to um, continue this work and expand the work. Um, and so we have seen a huge interest across um, organizations and local and state entities to position themselves to get access to these funds and to prioritize clean energy investments. And so I want to emphasize that the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund is not the only opportunity to, to get funding. And while that is what we will talk about at length today, um, there are other resources such as the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant, which I'm going to drop the link now into the chat. And these resources um, are also available and the Coalition for Green Capital is very interested in, if there are folks who want to follow up to have um, ongoing conversations about this additional resource. There is a webinar next week that EPA is hosting to provide more details. Okay, so this workshop is gonna be structured as a conversation. And once again, I um, mentioned that this is the mechanics of a green bank. You're gonna hear from the three panelists and they are gonna address a series of questions. So I'm about to read off the, the series of questions that I provided to them beforehand. They're gonna go through a conversation about these questions, but feel free to um, drop additional questions in the chat because the second half of this Sarah. workshop will um, be a question and answer portion. So give me a moment as I drop the questions. And I do not believe I the link. Here's the link for the other grant program. Um, so the questions that are going to be covered by our panelists is how was their organization created? What were the initial sources of capital to launch? Who are they partnering with? 
what was the timeline in establishing the entity, and also understanding what could be done to expedite the timeline, given that there are these resources available. What is the governance structure? What products do they offer or plan to offer? How do they work with green banks within the, within the network and other lending entities? How are they planning to use the funds provided through EPA to um, support the clean energy lending in their states? And how do they plan to work with the National Green Bank Network? Um, all right. And so I'm going to offer any an opportunity for any initial questions. Um, and I haven't seen any in the chat. So I am just going to move forward and ask Suan Andrade to be our first uh, presenter. Thank you, Nina. Hello, everyone. Why, why do I get asked first? <laughs> but it's OK. It's OK. I think Stephen should have gone. But happy to be here. Welcome, everybody. Actually, very excited to see a big group of people here um, to, to just share in our experience. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and answer all the questions that Nina just laid out and then leave obviously room for questions and any clarifications. So I'm Duan Andrade. I'm the executive director of SELF. The Solar and Energy Loan Fund is um, a community development finance institution, CDFI, and Green Bank. We were the first green CDFI and green bank, I guess, in the Southeast. Also in 2009, we were started up with an ARA, with, well, with a grant from the Department of Energy that was part of the previous stimulus package, the ARA. A couple of green banks started up with these funds as well. Um, at the time, it was just a clean energy fund and the charge was to create an innovative model to advance clean energy. Our founder and executive director uh, for 10 years, Doug Howard, was a county commissioner. And he um, saw the opportunity to jumpstart um, the clean energy economy when right after we had the Great Recession, I think it was, so yeah, when the housing crisis. So it was a way to stimulate job growth in a sector that he already saw was going to be the future and a very sustainable future. And it was a way to also try and um, uh, stimulate clean energy uh, opportunities in a state where there is no policy that actually incentivizes or is conducive to clean energy. So it was kind of taking like from a local government perspective because St. Lucie County was the one who actually uh, applied for this initial grant uh, to the Department of Energy. It was a way for a local government to kind of take matters into their own hands to kickstart a clean energy economy. Once that was done, uh, SELF was selected, well, actually St. Lucie County was selected amongst 20 other local governments in the nation to receive a $3 million grant. Imagine that, $3 million. And here we are comparing, I mean, if we compare ourselves to other banks like Connecticut Green Banks or even my friend and colleague, Paul here, um, Paul, you know, they were able to get a couple um, more zeros <laughs> after the three to get started, whether it's 30 million, 300 million, you know, it's just Green Banks come, up, come in all shapes and forms. So we started with this uh, grant and the first three years, it was a kind of a local um, government uh, revolving loan fund. After we weaned off the grant, we became independent, an independent nonprofit. In 2012, we were certified as a community development finance institution. Now, that was a strategic decision because we could have not been a CDFI, but we did it because our it kind of in, it baked into our mission and our DNA was to serve low and moderate income populations. So we wanted to make sure that we created a clean energy loan fund that was inclusive and that promoted um, climate equity from the get-go and also embraced 
uh, climate resilience. So in 2012, when we became a CDFI, then we knew we had a mandate to do 60% minimum of our lending in LMI communities or for LMI communities uh, residents. And we um, now have an average of 73% of our lending in low and moderate income uh, brackets. So um, let's see, with the initial $3 million, we had $1.6 million for a loan fund. 1.2 was for the three-year setup. And we decided to do unsecured lending to, hope, to help single family homeowners upgrade their homes with energy efficiency, clean energy, and climate resilience. Uh, after we weaned off the grant, we had more leeway. So we incorporated the resilience piece, which basically meant uh, changing out windows and, and, and doors to impact windows and doors to financing hurricane shutters and to doing uh, roof replacements. Now, again, we are based out of St. Lucie County, Florida. We operate now statewide. And we also have a footprint in Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, and soon Tennessee, and working with other partners, hopefully Texas soon. Um, and 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 this is not because we have the capacity or ability or even desire to go and establish selves all over the place, but because there is a need in the Southeast and all of these states that I just mentioned, starting with Florida, to build resiliency because we're some of the most vulnerable states in the country to climate impacts. So basically, um, we want to help other nascent banks, especially with a focus on, on the South, get set up to be able to do climate resilience, energy efficiency, and clean energy. So from the get-go, SELF was a triple bottom line impact model, but due to the limitation of our capital, we focused on doing these small micro loans, unsecured. And I think the, the major innovation that we're known for um, and that we have a track record for in the last 12 years is to do lending based on ability to repay rather than credit scores. So we um, wanted to make sure that we would be able to provide capital to low and moderate income uh, homeowners so that they could access these technologies that were, as we all know, usually just reserved for the wealthier people that could pay for them. Because the major barrier to accessing clean energy was the upfront cost. The second barrier is lack of credit and lack of access to financing. And a third barrier is also, uh, or continues to be, and was at the time, is getting um, or ensuring that the proper installations or upgrades are made. So a good contractor network. So basically, a uh, self-created model, we provide loan capital based on ability to repay to homeowners so they can then upgrade their homes through a contractor network that we pre-vet and qualify to do the job. And that way we ensure that the homeowner is protected and that the contractor also um, is, is paid. And in that process, we're creating more jobs in the green energy sector as well and opening up new um, markets for them. So with that, um, I think I've addressed the organizational structure created sources of capital. So what we did after we weaned off of the grant was go after investors. Now, the banks, of course, after three years being set up and barely one year of lending, first loan was in 2012. By the time we were ready to wean off of the grant, we had basically spent the one um, getting set up and you know staffing, et cetera. We really didn't have a track record. So banks would not give us capital. So the faith-based organizations were kind enough and also had the vision of uh, climate justice already back in 2012. And in 2013, our first investor after the grant was uh, were the Adrian Dominican Sisters. And they invested $100,000. And from there on, we actually were able to get 13 other faith-based organizations to invest in small amounts, everywhere from 50,000 to, um, to 200,000. And more recently, our largest faith-based investor has invested 800,000 in our organization. Once we started to prove ourselves and to have a track record, the, the nuns 
who had supported us, you know, helped us get the message out. We established our track record. Then we got CRA bank investments, small investments, 150,000, et cetera. Then 300,000. Two years ago, we signed our first $5 million line of credit with a bank. And last year we signed a $10 million line of credit with a bank plus two EQ2, which are equity, equity type investments of $4 million. So we've come a long way. The sources of capital now include banks, impact investors, faith-based organizations, peer-to-peer -peer crowdfunding through Kiva, CDFI federal funds, and soon national green bank funds, right? So this is just how we in a, in a place and in a region where there are no policies that incentivize um, clean energy, energy efficiency or resilience have been able to survive, have been able to deploy capital. We hit a $30 million milestone recently where we've done close to 3000 projects, 74% for low and moderate income. Um, we also were able to open up two new programs, one for landlords to rehab multifamily properties and a most recent project, a pro, so, sorry, program called Sage Homes to provide affordable capital um, and technical assistance for green, affordable and workforce housing. So I think um, with that, um, I wanna say our governance structure, we have a seven member uh, board board that we basically work for. They're very open, very nimble. It's very important for, that was, it was key for us to have a board that kind of let us create and innovate and do what we had to do. And, um, and another key strategic thing that I would um, mention here to nascent green banks was our partnerships with local governments. We started with a local government, but now we also have partnerships, Miami-Dade County, City of Orlando, Orange County, um, Hillsborough County, et cetera, Atlanta. I mean, they, these are critical because they give us legitimacy. They also help us get the word out and, um, and, and we become their implementation tool. So when they have their goals of going 100% renewable or you know whatever goals they have, in a state where there are no state goals per se, um, or no intentions to have any, local government take, take things into their own hands and need implementation tools. So when we approach them or they nowadays approach us, we are one more tool in their toolkit. So with that, um, if anybody have any questions or Nina, is there anything else you'd like me to share in particular with this? wonderful group. You did a fantastic job and definitely hit all the questions. And I'm going to hold questions from the audience until the other two panelists share. Um, and so thanks for those who have dropped questions um, in the chat. Continue to, to share them. Thank you, Duan. That was fantastic. And I do want to head to Stephen next. Well, happy Friday, everyone. Um, and that was... Uh... And that I was exactly why you went first to, to set the table for for us all. So I appreciate it, Juan, and uh, always enjoy hearing your story. Um, I think uh, of the three of us, at least, um, yours is the oldest uh, organization, and then Paul and the mine, right? And so we're going to go from is that right? Yeah, twelve uh, years. Twelve years, yeah. So we're going to go from from oldest to now the the youngest one on the block, and then Paul's in the middle and. He has a, a, a very uh, intriguing story as well. But as a part of our story, um, we, it really began with reaching out to Paul and reaching out to Duan and reaching out to other um, green banks just to understand you know, what they do and, uh, and, and see how we might fit. Uh, again, coming from a state where our legislature um, isn't poised to dedicate any revenue stream um, for these types of financing opportunities, um, you have to get creative. You gotta, you know, think of, of, of different ways that you can build an organization uh, that can be finance, resource, do the work uh, without the assistance of your state government, um, which would be nice. But um, you know, every state's different, and and that's that's okay too. So our story um, really began. In around 2016 or so, I um, started working in the 
property assess clean energy space with our PACE, which is um, a financial tool in Texas that was passed um, by the legislature in 2013. It came to effect around 2014, 2015. So by 2016, uh, Houston, which is uh, our biggest city, uh, adopted an ordinance to bring PACE to this market. Um, and I was working with a PACE lender actually out of, out of Connecticut, kind of part of that Connecticut Green Bank ecosystem. Um, and they were wanting to do projects in Texas, obviously, and, and PACE is a tool that you can use that will attach the finance to the, um, the tax parcel where the property is located, right? And so you can extend long-term debt, very patient debt, um, really competitive rates um, for energy efficiency improvements, solar resiliency, in Texas, even water conservation. Other states might have different um, um, eligible criteria. But those were the things that we were doing with PACE. And I was, I, when I first heard about the concept of PACE, I was like, this is wonderful. We can actually deploy capital for green energy improvements. Um, this is a godsend, this is a great idea. And um, and then sort of the the, the the slog of trying to um, to, to find um, opportunities, finding borrowers who um, for this particular tool, it, it takes a pretty sophisticated borrower to uh, to to want to enter into a pace financing agreement um, for a number of reasons because it's very highly secure um, type of, of of debt finance. Um, <clears throat> And so one of, the, um, one of the shortcomings of this market in Texas is that um, there's some limitations to what you can do with it. You can't use it for um, uh, new construction. You can't use it for public entities. Um, lenders, you can't use it for, for single family homes as well. Single family homes are, are ineligible. Um, and then the PACE lenders that exist nationally by and large, they want to be at a half million dollar and up mark for the project that they finance. And because kind of pace is tied to the, the property's value itself, in order to, um, to warrant half a million dollars for your property, that means your property has to have a huge amount of value attached to it, right? Which left out a lot of small commercial, left out a lot of nonprofits, uh, left out a lot of multifamily apartments out of that out of that bucket right and so i actually got into this business into this work because i wanted to be in those places i wanted to, to help small businesses i wanted to help nonprofits. i wanted to help multi-family uh, i wanted to help single family right um as duan mentioned you know uh, their background is kind of blended from public to private kind of a public to private uh mix uh well my background was in, in the public sector as well and to, before i did this stuff and so i have a lot of relationships uh, with local governments throughout the state of Texas. And so I wanted to be able to, to bring to them a, finance, a financing tool that they could use for their buildings, for their schools, their county buildings, you know, you name it. And so despite the promise of, of, of PACE as it's structured in this market right now, it had a lot of limitations. And because of those limitations, it, it occurred to me that we needed something different um, an, an alternative to, to PACE in Texas. And that's when I started asking around. Um, I think it was the folks, somehow I got in contact with the folks in North Carolina who were in the same boat, kind of trying to figure out um, what who they were and what they're going to be. Uh, I think I saw a hearing where Juan was um, testifying in the Senate or something, one of her many, many um, appearances in Congress. Uh, and I was like, man, I need to talk to her. She, she knows it. She, she gets it. Uh, I talked to Paul uh, as well as uh, along, along the, the way. And, uh, and I heard about this organization that was pushing for legislation in D.C. to establish a national um, climate bank that would be funded to help capitalize small folks like us in, in, on, the, on the ground level. And I was like, I need to get in touch with those folks. And so um, that was about a little over a year ago, maybe about um, actually right before the administration took office is when we um, began talking really seriously to the coalition bring capital about you know just lessons learned, best practices uh, around governance, best practices around you know products that we want to bring to the market and 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 that sort of thing. And it was um, it just so happened that. Um, 
you know, the new administration wanted to pass this law called Build Back Better. And instead of having these one-off um, pieces of legislation to create this national climate bank, Build Back Better was going to include that legislation into that larger package of bills, uh, that larger package of bills into one bill. And so we were like, okay, this is it. We, it's, 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 it's happening. This is really happening. We got to get our ducks in a row. Uh, and that's when we formed as a nonprofit. Uh, we created a board of, of six then, seven now, because I'm now on the board. I was, uh, I was the uh, CEO before, but now I'm on the board as chair and uh, identified some of the, um, uh, because I, I, I work in this space in the environment and, and then in, um, in public policy, there were a number of like, you know, giants in Texas who kind of have to be your go-to first to, 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 to give you that type of um, credibility from, from, from the beginning. And so um, we brought in a esteemed group of, of colleagues to form the basis of the, of the governing board. Um, we got bylaws. I think we were looking at North Carolina's draft bylaws, or I think the Colts of Green Capital gave us like a template set of bylaws. Um, and then our general counsel kind of massaged them to fit what we were trying to do in, here in Texas. And so we got bylaws adopted. Um, we have begun talking to foundations to help with some initial seed funding. And, and we were able to raise a um, little, little over half a million dollars in, um, in philanthropic uh, support, which uh, allowed us to then bring in some consultants and stock partners to help us get smarter around the market dynamics at the state level. In states as, as large as Texas were really, um, you know, um, because I ran for office at a statewide office back uh, in a previous life. Um, I can tell you firsthand that Texas is the size of Germany. Like literally, we are the size of Germany. Uh, and so uh, I lost uh, Fort Edge trying to hack, trying to go back and forth throughout this state uh, for votes. Um, that was a good car, but uh, but I ran it. I ran it down to to its uh, to its down down through the wheels. So um, anyway. So there are different parts of the state that have different needs, right? And so understanding market dynamics where the urban areas differ from the border areas that differ from the rural areas. And then in fact, the urban areas differ from each other, right? Um, Austin and Dallas are, for instance, both urban areas, but um, you know, Austin is a regulated market. Dallas is a deregulated market. Houston's deregulated. San Antonio is regulated, right? And so how does that, how, what does that mean? in terms of the need for financing and capital. Um, and it'll take different shapes, right? Some of those regulated markets had incentives in place to you know, provide for rebates that you may not find in other parts of the state. And so the contractor community is different in these different places. So getting smarter about the, um, the nature of the state, um, understanding where those, uh, those hot spots are in the state that are truly desperate for um, the type of, of capital that, that we will be providing to them, um, and then, you know, uh, executing on our mission of eradicating energy poverty in Texas. And so we're really built, we're, we are a mission-based um, nonprofit green bank. And our mission is to eradicate energy poverty in Texas. We've identified 4 million families that live with some sort of energy burden uh, in this state. And we know that um, just by making some improvements to their homes or to their um, their, their multifamily apartments, um, that we can help them uh, achieve an energy savings that not only um, will make their energy bills more manageable, but may also create um, a, a positive cash flow uh, for those families. And so, you know, we see this as a tool for um, not only economic development, because we know it's going to create jobs, we know it's going to, um, you know, help families. Uh, but we see this as a as a catalyst for the opportunities for, for generational wealth, right? And so, how do we create um, a, 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 an environment through which um, what we do can help folks um, have more positive cash flow that they can then use um, for you know those trade offs that they've been making for the last you know 20, 30, 40 years as it relates to you know the energy bills or groceries, your energy bills are transportation, your energy bills are, are medicine, right? And, and those are legit trade-offs that, that folks here are making, or even worse, 
whether or not to turn on your AC at all in the, in, in the hot summer months in, 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 in Houston or in Austin or in Laredo, right? Uh, which, you know, for families, for most average families, they don't have to have that. They don't have to think about it, you know? And so uh, we, are, we are really trying to um, um, understand from a lot of the folks who've already been there and done that um, so that we're not making rookie mistakes. And so that, that's one of the benefits of, of being a part of a, a network of green banks is that, you know, we can look to self, um, you know, who is the only nonprofit CDFI and we want to also be a CDFI. And so we brought around our team folks to help us to, to move in that direction um, and also look at the products that already work in Florida, right? Because Florida and Texas have a lot of similarities. Um, and so, you know, to, to, to look at what works in Florida, for instance, and, and, and see how do we bring that to, to Texas? How do we dust it off? Maybe, you know, call it something different, you know, make, make it Texify it, uh, but, you know, make it work here in Texas without reinventing the wheel all over again. And so, um, you know, working smart is, is one of our key goals um, as a performance indicator for us uh, in terms of, of being more efficient with, with the stuff, with the time and the resources that we have. So to, um, to, 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 to land this ship, um, basically, I wanna make sure that I cover enough of the questions uh, in this story, um, but it is, it is truly a, um, um, I have been profoundly proud to be a part of this ecosystem where um, so many people are open and transparent uh, and, and, and are helpful and, and they truly want to, to see other green banks succeed. And I think that um, that is, you know, the, the biggest takeaway that I want everyone here, you know, who are thinking about doing this to know that, you know, you, you're not by yourself. Um, there are folks who have already tried and failed and tried again uh, so that you don't have to fail, on, at least on those things that, that have already been tested. Uh, and so, you know, we welcome the questions that you may have, um, you know, the concerns that you may have, um, and, uh, and hopefully, you know, give you enough confidence, and enough information that you will move forward in your journey uh, to establishing the Green Bank where you, where you are. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, and I feel like as a, a, a litmus test of the, uh, the ability to be agile and to pivot quickly, I think from everyone you're going to hear on this panel, they're all talking about how they all had to shift to the dynamics of this changing environment. And I want to caveat, I should have said this in the beginning, next week we're hoping to hear from the EPA. So there might be some need for some additional pivoting, um, but we are all very excited to, to, to know, uh, you know, to hear what is to come. And so let's have our final panelist, uh, Paul, share about his work. Thanks, Nina. It's great to be here with everyone. It's great to present uh, alongside Duan and Stephen. Um, so I'll jump right into it. I think Nina just provided a, an excellent segue in pivoting. So our organization, the way we were created, a lot of folks don't know this, um, but my previous role as the Chief Operating Officer of the Colorado Energy Office Prior to that, I worked at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. My role was to uh, research and publish at the lab um, on innovative financing mechanisms that supported clean energy, not only at the utility scale, but distributed level. And then when I went to work at the state, I was tasked with implementing what I had been researching. So I was a lead author of legislation that launched CPACE in the state. Uh, we had worked to launch a statewide residential energy efficiency loan program as well. So we had done a pretty good job at the state level. Uh, we had statewide commercial loan products, statewide residential loan products, but those programs took forever to launch. It, we were very abundantly aware after that, that the state uh, incubating and launching finance programs took a lot of time. It wasn't efficient. And based on my prior research at the lab, we actually started trying to create a green bank in Colorado uh, dating back to 2015. So we had drafted legislation. We had sought to create a quasi-public green bank. We were essentially trying to copy Connecticut's model, um, but we didn't have the votes in 2015 and we didn't have the votes in 2016. And so that bill never saw the light of day. 
Uh, so after two years of failing in that approach, we went back to the drawing board, licked our wounds, and ultimately really asked ourselves, why are we trying to do this through legislation? I think the idea was, if you do it through legislation, you can tap into general fund. But the reality in Colorado at that time is even if we had created a quasi public entity, we were not going to touch general fund dollars. That was just not going to happen. So really, as we evaluated that, there was very little benefit to us becoming a state or a quasi public entity. We'd be a political football. We weren't going to get funding. Um, it, it was just going to be too complicated. And so we ultimately then decided to take an approach where we incorporated a completely wholly autonomous, independent 501c3 nonprofit. Former Governor Hickenlooper, as one of his last acts as governor, proclaimed that we were the state's green bank. And that was pretty much it. Um, so we're quite different. You, uh, Nevada Clean Energy Fund is a wholly autonomous, independent 501c3, very similar to us. But there was legislation that essentially formally announces that they're the state green bank. Um, ours, we just went and incorporated a nonprofit. It took a matter of weeks. Um, it did take about six months to get our 501c3 standing. Um, but I offer that as an example because we've been very fortunate in the state that everybody has essentially acknowledged that we're the state's green bank. Um, so I'm, I, I wouldn't say that that would be the case in every state, but it gives you an example of a very unique approach that we took, which was literally just incorporating a nonprofit and then working with government actors to uh, essentially proclaim that we're serving in this role for the state. Um, so we had a pivot. It, it took a few attempts. We tried to use the models that were out there and several of them are excellent models, but ultimately I think Stephen hit on this. Every state's different, that's fine. And we had to find the model that worked for our state that was most comfortable with our uh, leaders and stakeholders and constituents and that ultimately uh, landed on this nonprofit approach. Um, so that's how we were created. Um, the initial sources of capital. So we were incorporated in December of 2018. I came on full-time in September of 2019. And my role was to essentially develop the business plan, go raise capital, develop our inaugural loan products so that people that we were trying to raise capital from knew what we were going to do with their capital. Um, and that process was long and it was hard. And it took about two years before we actually secured our funding. We were very fortunate in that current Governor Polis, instead of orphaning us, really leaned into the fact that we're the state's green bank and through legislation directed $30 million to come to us. Uh, five of that is to support our operations between the date of the passage of that bill and June 30th, 2025. And then 25 of it is our investment capital. One interesting data point for folks to be aware of is I'd be shocked if we get state money uh, going forward. So our directive is you've got three and a half years to not only make this work, but to drive enough revenue to sustain the operations that you build now. And so that is our, our, our North Star. We're constantly focused on we need to generate revenue enough to uh, support the capacity that we build today. So that's something that's also somewhat unique about us in that there isn't going to be ongoing appropriations to support our operations. We have to be self-sustainable uh, uh, by June 30th, 2025. So that was our funding. Um, now, based on the story that I just mentioned to you, that meant it was incredibly important for us to generate revenue immediately. And so we had two choices, and this goes to the next question of who did we partner with? We had the choice of we could develop the internal capacity to do loan underwriting and servicing ourselves by hiring credit analysts, servicers, but that would have taken, call it six to nine months to get those people on board, trained, staffed, and we wouldn't do our first deal for nine months. Or we could partner with a local entity that has that infrastructure in place. And so we chose the latter. Uh, we inked a relationship with a local CDFI. They're called Impact Development Fund. They're a fantastic shop. We do all originations. Uh, CCF does all program design. We have the final say of what gets approved, but IDF does what they do excellently, which is when it comes time to uh, field a loan application, they're the ones that compile all the financials. They do the underwriting based on the underwriting criteria that CCF has developed. 
And then ultimately after the loan is funded, they do the servicing. And I offer that because that allowed us to do our first deal 12 months or uh, one month after the money hit our account. We had already closed our first commercial deal. Um, and it really helped us accelerate our first year. So that money hit our account in November, 2021. So just about 14 months ago. And in those 14 months, we've deployed 20% of our capital. Uh, we have funded over 13 commercial projects. We've supported over 400 residential projects. We've mobilized private capital at a 13 to one leverage ratio. Our first year results have like bought us a ton of goodwill and gotten a lot of pressure off of us in year one. So I think as you're looking at partnerships and structure, I think it's important to think about what allows you to hit the ground running. And again, it depends on your state, but in our state, I would have been concerned if it had taken us a year to do a deal. It would have been a bad look for us and it probably would have led to negative consequences. So we really needed to have partnerships and a structure that allowed us to do deals right out the gates. Um, and that's also allowed us to generate revenue immediately. So our first year revenue, we actually exceeded our target by 92%. So we're well on that glide path towards reaching our self-sustainability goals as long as we continue to execute the way we did our first year. Um, so that was a really important partnership with us uh, from the actual administration perspective of the fund. But we also have a very important partnership with our state. We call ourselves government adjacent. So we're wholly autonomous, which there's a lot of benefits to that. But we do have government member on our board to make sure that we're aligned with the current administration. It is a non-voting member because we never want our organization to become uh, a political football but it does allow us uh, a nice connection to uh, the governor's office to make sure that we're all aligned in terms of achieving our climate goals. Um, and then Dewan hit it. I mean, there's so many other local municipal partnerships, the local nonprofits that are administering grant and rebate programs. We partner with everyone. I mean, the lenders in our state, it's hugely important. I think as we think of green banks, you know, our goal, at least in my mind, is to unlock the vast sums of private capital that are sitting on the sidelines. We're never going to have enough money to achieve Colorado's climate goals. We need to tap into the banks, the credit unions, the private equity players, the pension funds, the insurance companies. And so we really, uh, this past year, we did uh, engage with over 22 lenders, something that we track. And we're really hoping that's going to be um, almost every lender in the state over time. Uh, so partnerships with lenders have been hugely important too. And that's really what's allowed us to achieve that leveraging ratio. The timeline for establishing our entity, uh, as I mentioned, if you think back to December, 2018 to funding November, 2021 was really three years to actually uh, kind of launch our operations in earnest. It took us a while to get that funding. But once we got the funding and based on the approach and the partnerships that I just described, we had a hugely successful first year. So our first year as we've talked to our local stakeholders was foundational. We now have a very strong foundation and we produce really strong results. And then our next year, as we've been saying to them is going to be transformational. This is where we grow our funds. We're a $30 million fund, which is really great but it's a drop in the bucket. We need to be investing billions in Colorado alone to achieve our climate goals. And so in our strategic plan this year, we've committed to our board to triple the capacity of our portfolio. Um, and that's something that really is gonna guide all of our actions over the coming year. And that'll be through a mix of different sources, whether it be EPA funding or just classic fundraising or setting up uh, portfolio sale mechanics with local lenders, which we have inked uh, partnerships already in place for people to purchase the paper off of our balance sheet. Um, so it's a mix of different portfolio growth opportunities, but the name of the game for us is to grow this thing now as quickly as we possibly can. Our governance structure, it is a board of directors. We do have an ex officio government member on that board. It's the executive director of our state energy office. Again, it's a non-voting member, but it gave the state a lot of assurances that they're going to have some oversight of the funds. Um, and really I answer to that board, if I'm not doing well, they can fire me. Um, so that's our structure. And I think it's a prudent one. Uh, it really ensures accountability, transparency, 
because we are managing taxpayer dollars and we take that responsibility extremely seriously. So I am happy to answer to a board. Um, uh, and I think it was the right way to structure this whole thing. The products that we offer, we have chosen to focus on the built environment in our first year. So we have a mix of commercial loan products um, that go from everything from a bridge loan product to a short-term loan product to a long-term loan product. So I'll explain what I mean by that. Stephen hit on really, as green banks, we feel we're responsible for filling gaps. So the gaps that we saw in the commercial building sector in Colorado are small projects. Um, I'd say less than 500,000 is the notable gap, but really less than a million, people could argue that's a gap as well. So all of our loan products are focused on small projects. We don't do any deals that are larger. Those larger projects can easily get capital elsewhere because people will make money off of those deals. So we focus on small deals, but we also recognize if you're doing a single measure replacement, you maybe don't need a 15-year loan. So we have short-term loans. Um, that, and again, I think there's this old adage that it takes the same amount to underwrite a $50,000 loan as it does a $5 million loan. We don't think that should be the case. That's absurd. We underwrite $50,000 loans quickly. We fund those loans in 10 days. Whereas if we have a $500,000 loan, we will secure real estate. We'll take a subordinate lien on the property. We'll do more due diligence on those deals. But with our shorter term, smaller amounts, we'll do a light underwrite. They're unsecured. We're willing to take on that risk. Um, and so it was important for us to have that mix of shorter and longer term. The other thing in Colorado is we pay very low electricity rates. So we did need a 15 year loan product because if you have deep retrofits or you're throwing solar, anything like that, you could have a payback of 12 years. And so the five year product doesn't make sense for those people. And so we have a 15 year commercial loan product to make the economics work of deeper retrofit projects. And then we recognize a bridge loan was really important. So another partnership we've set up are grant programs. Unfortunately, USDA and a lot of these grant programs are set up so that you have to front the money, you have to pay for the project, then they'll come in and inspect it, and then they'll give you money. Well, our farmers can't do that. Our small business owners can't do that. And so we actually now have partnerships with four different grant programs in which we provide very cheap bridge capital so that they can pay for the project. And then when their grant proceeds come in, we actually secure the grant proceeds as our collateral. So it's very low risk to us. Um, I think this is gonna be a huge opportunity with IRA funding, because a lot of these tax credits and transferability these programs is gonna be the same thing. Um, so that's our commercial. Um, in residential, the statewide loan product that we had launched at the energy office while I was there, we've now taken ownership of that program. So this is a program where we manage a loan loss reserve that has incentivized multiple credit unions to do uh, statewide residential energy efficiency, electrification and clean energy loans. Um, we're looking to dramatically scale that program through investments in technology, uh, marketing and standardization. Um, and that program is working extremely well right now. But because it's in partnership with credit unions who face a certain reality, um, it's mostly for upper income people. Uh, our average credit score in that program, I think is 740. So then looking again, what's the gap? It's low and moderate income folks. It's folks with uh, poor credit scores. And so we actually uh, just recently, it should hopefully be hitting the news soon, but we have partnered with a, a very major generation and transmission utility in the state. We've designed a standardized on-bill repayment program with them that is then going to be offered to all of their co-op member utilities who can opt into the program. But we didn't want a fragmented uh, state where you have different on-bill programs all over the state. And that's why if you want to participate in our program, you got to abide by the box that we've created. So it's going to be all the same rules, same paperwork, same everything. We think our contractors will love that. Uh, we've got our first few utilities have already signed on to that. And the beauty of on-bill repayment is we're not even going to look at credit score. We're not looking at debt-to-income ratios. It's if you've paid your utility bill on time for the last six months, you automatically qualify. And I think this is going to be a game changer for our lower and moderate income households that can't access Renew, our other statewide loan program. 
So we feel with that offering, we've really covered a lot of the gaps in the residential sector as well. Um, so that's where we've started. Looking ahead, multifamily affordable housing is probably our next biggest priority, and then transportation, because we are tasked with serving the whole gamut of our climate goals. So in the long, distant future, you could imagine us getting involved in industrial decarbonization, hydrogen, um, everything. But we've started with kind of built environment, multifamily affordable housing next, transportation after that. And then we'll look at kind of next frontiers after that. But within transportation, the issues that we see are fleet transitions. We need to figure something out with that. On the consumer side, how do we get low and moderate income households access to electric vehicles? Because unfortunately, all of our incentives are tax credits, which don't work for everyone. Um, and then uh, electric vehicle infrastructure. Uh, so really uh, supporting the build out of charging stations across the state in Colorado. So those are the products that we currently offer. And those are the ones that we're looking forward to. I mean, how we work with other green banks in the network. Uh, I mean, these are amazing thought leaders. A lot of these people have been doing this far longer than we have. Um, uh, folks are deploying new products. It seems like every week that uh, why recreate the wheel? We've seen so many products that we have just kind of taken from other green banks in other states. Our CPAYS program, I modeled that legislation after Connecticut's. Our Renew program is very similar to the Smarty loan program that's offered through a lot of green banks. Um, so we, we not only partner in terms of thought leadership and comparing notes, but also in program design. That's currently looking to the future. I do think green banks one opportunity that I'd love to see us um, tap into more is standardizing products, is like offering very similar products, because as we talk about achieving our national climate goals, we need to create secondary markets. It's the holy grail. It's the way we scale all of this, and we can't do it unless we're standardizing products across our organization. So I'm hoping that's more of a future opportunity, opportunity to do that across our organizations. And then we plan to work with the National Green Bank. Um, kind of in a similar capacity. As the National Green Bank looks to make indirect investments, we'd love to tap into that. And we'd love to really pursue as much standardization with those offerings as we can in hopes of, of kind of supporting those secondary markets. Um, so we're excited about the National Green Bank. It, I think hopefully it'll be a really um, good opportunity for us to bring some additional capital to Colorado. If we get that capital, I think what we're looking to do is expand our current offerings and then launch new offerings. That's, I mean, in its simplest form, that's what we're looking to do with that capital. So I'll pause there. I know that's a lot. I'm sorry I sprinted through there, but I wanted to make sure I, I hit on all the, the key points. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, the, the information that was shared by you all was incredibly helpful and folks are dropping questions in the chat throughout the conversation. Um, I know we did talk about some of the hurdles associated with legislation, but we do think that legislation is a great tool to help um, the longevity of green banks. And so I want to give Henry Lippman a, a moment to give a, a quick download on what, what's happening in New Mexico as they're uh, a great partner. We're really, um, we're really uh, encouraged by the work that's going on in their current legislative session. Yeah, hi, hi everyone. So New Mexico, I think, is probably next on the list of states likely to pass green bank legislation. Um, and by hearing from Paul, you've heard uh, a lot of the same things that New Mexico is considering, as Colorado's neighbor of theirs and their. Um, have been inspired by what they've seen in Colorado and want to have something similar. Um, this legislation emerged because A, um, a lot of the environmental community in New Mexico started to see the Colorado, um, Paul's team in Colorado um, being effective. And the second piece was the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, which they understood um, created a big pot of money that New Mexico could really benefit from. It's a state with a lot of need and also a lot of potential energy resources. So in a lot of ways, it's um, a place that really should be getting a big piece of these funds, but um, didn't really have the infrastructure to put it in place. So um, some sponsors on the Senate Conservation Committee out there uh, have been working with some uh, environmental advocates in the state 
to put together um, green bank legislation to get a head start so that when that money starts getting released um, from the greenhouse gas reduction fund, New Mexico has the infrastructure in place already um, and isn't waiting sort of at the back of the line um, in terms of you know getting their chance to use that money because I think as everybody here knows um, you know investing in in climate projects is it's not the kind of thing that you can just throw money at uh, and expect and expect results a, a lot of prep work has to happen um, and so that's what they're trying to to do now um, the interesting legislative debate that's going on over there um, now is what corporate form the Green Bank should take. Um, as Paul talked about a few moments ago, you know, Colorado is a great example of how green banks, not always, but often kind of straddle the nonprofit government line. Um, and um, in New Mexico, they're sort of looking at, okay, how do we maintain, um, you know, create an independent organization that's free from political influence, um, but also has adequate government oversight to ensure responsible stewardship of public funds. So this is not a wealthy state, um, and they're proposing putting 20 million tax dollars into this, um, and they're saying we can't just, you know, we, we can't just um, put, put the money in there and then have no, no say over it. So um, on Thursday, yesterday, it feels like longer ago, um, the Green Bank bill um, that did create um, a nonprofit very similar to the Colorado Clean Energy Fund passed out of committee um, seven to one. Some of the senators who voted for it said that in order to vote for it on the floor, they would need to see more robust oversight and clarity around what the legal status um, of that organization would actually be. Um, and so, you know, these are these are the kinds of questions um, that will come up, particularly, you know, those of you who are working on this from the legislative perspective um, <clears throat> are going to be facing, um, but there's a lot of good solutions out there from Nevada to Colorado to Connecticut um, to Michigan. Um, so, you know, if you are in that situation, uh, you know, Representative Briscoe, I, I, I see you down there. Uh, we have, we have um, a, lot of, a lot of tools and expertise to call upon to, to figure out those questions. So, um, my sincere hope is that by um, mid-March, um, Green Bank legislation will be passed in New Mexico and we'll have, um, you know, a new uh, gold standard piece of legislation to go along with some of those other ones like um, Colorado, Nevada, and some other places that, um, you know, other states can use, borrow from, um, and adapt for their own needs. Great. Thank you, Henry. So we're gonna shift now to a question and answer, question and answer portion. So there were a few questions dropped in the chat. We'll start with those. And then if you have additional questions, feel free to share them in the chat or raise your hand um, and ask the question yourself. So I'm gonna start off with, um, and Paul actually mentioned their example of how they evaluate the ability to repay. Um, and Duan, would you um, feel comfortable with responding to um, how self uses different evaluations to other than the credit score to, to legitimize the ability to repay? Sure. Um, so we created a underwriting method um, back in 2013 that basically does a deep dive into the person's um, income expenses and then identifies um, what disposable income they would have left to repay the loan. So we actually built this out. Originally, it was like a spreadsheet with 13 tabs, and now we actually have it systematized. We've created our own little software with a plug and play. And I have permission from Stephen here good colleague to share that we're actually going to be working with Steven on giving him access directly like plug and play into our underwriting. Um, because again, I mean, you know, uh, Paul's example is a wonderful example when you can work with a utility that's willing to do on bill, you know, financing. Um, and that's based on, you know, yeah, if somebody pays their energy, you can assume that they're going to, you know, pay an energy upgrade. But because we do broader lending that includes um, resilience and I was saying like roof replacements, 
especially to help people access insurance, which is so important for climate resilience, right? We also added some disability and aging in place to help elderly people withstand climate impact. So I guess our, our method is really kind of not dependent on anybody. It's completely independent. We really focus on each individual's ability to repay. So um, yeah, we've, you know, over the last uh, 12 years, we've been doing lending. Um, it's a deep, high touch lending, which is why this, uh, I think Paul made this comment about how it takes, you know, a couple of years to launch. And what we figured is we've created something that would shorten that curve as well, that you could, once you have capital, or even if you don't cap have capital, you could launch in six months, set up for our plug and play would be like uh, 45 days. My point is that you know, with this method, we've been able to do $30 million in lending with less than 2% default rate. It works. We don't necessarily, we're, I'm not here to tell people, you know, get into the plug and play because we're not like desperate to sell a plug and play, but I'm trying to tell everybody it's starting up, don't reinvent the wheel, look around for, um, for methodologies that have been proven and exist because it's hard to set this up. You know, it's, it's hard to identify and um, so yeah, I mean, again, that's, that's what I can say about our methodology. It's based on micro lending methodology that's used internationally, which is kind of my background. So for me, it's a little bit of second nature, but we had a lot of pushback at the, at the beginning. I mean, you know, like I said, the nuns were like, yes, we get it because the nuns work worldwide with models like these serving, um, under banked and unbanked populations. So they understood it. But it took us a long time to get banks and other philanthropies to actually support our work. I mean, I was rejected more times than I can count as a CFO and chief strategic officer. So um, yeah, it's basically tapping into that disposable income and building a loan that they can repay without putting them at risk. Um, and, and, making, and by the way, one of the things we didn't uh, mention is that through this whole process, we're focusing on like, carbon reduction and resilience and climate equity and all that, but we haven't really touched on the financial inclusion piece, which is huge because throughout this whole process with these small loans, we're also helping people build their credit up, which then opens up all sorts of other opportunities uh, for people, especially in low and moderate income. So I'm sorry, I, I hope I kind of went a roundabout way, but I hope I answered the question. No, that was fantastic. And thank you for the, the financial inclusion piece, because it is something that we overlook um, quite often. Stephen, did you have something you wanted? Yeah, and one thing to add to that, um, you know, what makes this work different from a lot of the work that a lot of, you know, traditional lenders are involved with is that the product themselves actually create a savings ratio, right? And so, you know, we look closer at what the project is that is being done at that house and, and can determine what the projected savings uh, to investment ratios are over the term of the loan, for instance. And so there's some comfort there in knowing that um, the savings that's achieved because you have this new HVAC or you have this new insulation or what have you is actually going to reduce your energy costs then that savings, that that that, that savings there, uh, it can also be seen as a way to service the debt to do the same. Right. So, yeah. And Steve, can I just add to that because I think it's really important also to um, to talk about kind of the broader scope of impacts that this work has, right? Because at the very beginning, and back, I remember back in 2013, 2014, when we were reporting to the Department of Energy, it was all really focused on energy, 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 right? In a silo. Was, do energy savings pay for these investments? No, energy, we can't do energy uh, lending at a residential level because, you know, it doesn't repay, it doesn't pay for itself. Well, the reality is that people, especially in low and moderate income, and anybody really, they don't go out and replace their ACs because they're gonna save 25% uh, at the residential level. At the commercial scale, it's huge. But at the residential level, it's huge in terms of savings, but it's not the motivation. What motivates the change is quality of life, health, comfort, necessity. 
I mean, it's not a luxury anymore to to need a you know an AC in Florida in extreme heat, North Carolina, Texas, extreme cold or heat. We need heat pumps and we need ACs. So what we learned early on is that people were not making the decision to invest based on the savings, not at the residential scale. They were changing out their ACs for high efficiency air conditioners, number one, because they needed to, and number two, they would switch it out with a high efficiency air conditioner because they could afford that. They had the upfront capital to do that. So, you know, we uh, fully embrace now the fact that our lending uh, hits on not only the energy efficiency piece and, and, you know, decarbonizing piece, but quality of life and health impacts are huge. And we just closed two PRIs, which are program related investments with two foundations in Georgia, Healthcare Georgia and Go Atlanta. Both of those really focused on the climate, um, sorry, on the health impacts of doing these energy efficiency upgrades. So for the, you know, for all of you that are thinking about this, I just wanted to share that with you because I think sometimes we, we get too caught up in that uh, the savings, you know, as a source of repayment. Yes, it helps offset the costs of the loan at a residential scale, but we have to look at the whole impact. And at the commercial scale, of course, it makes total sense because energy is probably the largest uh, of the operating costs, right, in a, in a place like Florida or with extreme weather. Thank you both. I'm gonna, I think it's a good question to follow up on with um, if there are existing organizations that can take the role of the Green Bank rather than creating new organizations. So I know there's a back and forth in the chat, but because this is being recorded, I wanted to bring it up. Um, we have partners within the American Green Bank Consortium that are state authorities that had existing energy efficiency or clean energy investments uh, and investment portfolio or programs. And they have taken on the role of responsibility as the, as the state green bank. And uh, that is been for information that I could share um, at, a later, at a later date, but that is something that, that does exist. Um, I know um, we have about 15 minutes left, so I want to get through a few more of these questions. Um, so we had another question about self, self-sustaining income. What are the revenue streams that uh, support self, self, uh, self-sufficiency for, for your organizations? Um, and this actually, this question was directed to, to Paul. Yeah, sure. So our primary revenue sources right now are origination fees that we charge to a project, typically 1%. um, And then the interest that we charge to each loan. I think the benefit, or it's not even a benefit, the huge benefit that we have is the the money that we receive from the state, the cost of that capital is 0%. So we earn everything on the interest that we charge. Whereas if you were fundraising, so we've looked at other sources of capital as we're looking to grow, you know, that's not always going to be the case. We're going to take on debt onto our balance sheet. And then we just earn the spread between whatever the co- our cost of capital is and our interest rate. So we, we are fortunate in that all the interest we charge right now comes in house. Those are our two primary forms of capital. That said, we are referring some projects to other institutions and occasionally we'll get a referral fee with that. So as I said, we don't focus on large projects, but we come across large projects all the time. Um, So occasionally that's a very small amount of our revenue, um, but it is something that um, does help supplement our total revenue. And then this is more um, kind of passive, but We've also invested our capital in T-bills. T-bills are yielding really well right now. So if you are able to come into money up front, uh, we weren't, our goals from the state weren't to spend 100% of our loan capital in year one. And so we uh, have uh, invested in a waterfall approach to make sure that we never constrain our liquidity. We always have to be able to satisfy near-term loan uh, demand. Um, but investing that capital has also produced investment income. So that, that's really the range of uh, income that we're taking in right now. 
Yeah, and I'm just going to add to that um, and just kind of reinforce that self-sufficiency is, again, a different challenge for different types of, you know, green bank institutions. Um, Paul made a very good point. He has 0% capital right now. So even if he takes on debt, he can blend a large part of his capital or use, you know, his zero cost capital to, to leverage, to blend, to, to do a bunch of things. Um, and in our case, in Florida, not having had any state funding, no, you know, energy office funding, nothing, we have basically had to survive based on debt. But not only debt, I mean, it's it would have been impossible if we only had debt. As a CDFI, we were able to apply for CDFI fund um, TA and FA awards once a year. It's a competitive process, so you know we struggled one year or two. Um, uh, but we were able to get funding. That helps because when you get that type of federal funding, you have to deploy the capital. And as you've collected, it becomes unrestricted and becomes yours to be able to operate. But we were struggling the very the first years because of that kind of, um, you know, that tension with raising debt capital and raising uh, grant funds. And we never had enough grant funds to be able to cover our costs. The CDFIs operate at around a 60% self-sufficiency. So every year we have to go out and raise a lot of grant capital to plug the holes. Um, but our goal, like Paul, is to become 100% self-sufficient, but we can only do that with scale and low cost capital. So this is why I think the National Green Bank is, is so important because it will help us um, gain access to, to grant funds so that we can build capacity and then also scale more quickly and have low cost, flexible capital with, with longer and better terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, just to kind of give some insight on our, our way we envision that sustainability model. Um, it, it definitely includes the things that, that were just mentioned. Um, as kind of uh, foundational pieces of it, right? So you're gonna have, um, you know, in some cases, origination fees, in some cases, uh, interest, um, and you're gonna have grant funding, it's gonna be a part of it. Um, and we're actually going through that thought process now of building out a dynamic, long-term sustainability model, um, where we can kind of begin to see, you know, what percentage of the entire amount of, of funds that we have available to us um, should be used for, you know, kind of that built environment should be used for um, uh, other things and how much needs to be raised uh, through grants in order to, you know, keep a steady trajectory in the right direction. Um, but, but one thing I want to add to that is that two things. Um, to Paul's point earlier um, in, in how we all grow outside of this, you know, single family retrofit financing world, to scaling to do larger projects, at least like, you know, being in the capital stack of like community solar projects or um, getting involved with some, some industrial decarbonization opportunities or, you know, other types of renewable energy projects. That's not just the stuff that we've seen before. That those would be larger wells in our portfolio that are going to be a key part of that sustainability growth plan for us. Um, on the finance side. And then separately, um, you know, we don't see ourselves just as a green bank. We see ourselves as an institution that is needed in Texas. And part of that uh, institution building process is, you know, what kind of programmatic needs do we need to deliver to the community as well, uh, where we can, where we can raise some of that philanthropic money in order to support whether it's workforce development opportunities, whether it's, um, you know, um, just um, energy literacy opportunities, energy slash financial literacy opportunities, um, whether it is, you know, advocacy and, and, and just public awareness. Uh, and so, you know, I, I would ask that, you know, as you all are going through this process of kind of thinking about, you know, what you want to be when you grow up as a green bank, um, don't limit yourself just to the finance stuff. Um, you know, think broader in terms of, of being a true institution that can service the community uh, in, in more ways than one. Thank you all. I think it's a, a good segue to a question that we got about 
building the right team and getting the technical expertise in order to have success across your entities. Can you all speak to um, the internal capacity building that you're all doing? Be happy to jump in just because, I mean, we've, as I said, that the funding hit our account in November, 2021. So this last year was really focused on capacity building. At the time, it was just myself. We're now a team of eight. Um, so I can walk you through maybe the skill sets and the roles that we thought were important with our unique experience, recognizing it's going to be very different uh, in other areas, depending on the structure um, and where you're at. But so with us, I mean, my background, I was an investment banker for the start of my career, very different world. I was actually working on Wall Street, so not very relevant to lending per se, um, but I always had a very traditional finance experience. Um, I think you have to find somebody who's very mission oriented. So a strong financial background, but really wants to do something different with finance. And that was at least my experience. I wanted to use finance for good. I wasn't really passionate about what I was doing in my past career. Um, and when I got really interested in climate change, I had the light bulb moment of recognizing there's really two levers you can pull. It's the cost of the technology and then it's cost of capital. Um, and you got to maybe find somebody who's a glutton for punishment if they're tasked with starting this whole thing up because it is hard, but it's so worthwhile and the opportunities are immense. And this model, to Dewan's point, it works. Uh, we have so many examples. It's working. So I think for at least, I don't know if that's for the leader or whatever it may be, but I think you do have to have some strong financial chops and background, but more of a mission orientation. Um, in terms of our staff, though, my number two, the person that I was really focused on hiring right out the gates was a strong operations person, um, whether they had finance background or not. Uh, the person I selected fortunately did. He came from the venture capital space, but he was really tasked uh, for the VC fund of developing the operations for the startups that they were working with. So this is the person that helped us develop our foundation, like our entire operational foundation, which is immensely important because we were a brand new entity. We had people breathing down our neck, understandably, because we were just given a large sum of money. Um, and this person has dialed in our operations to a degree that I'm still shocked how much he's done in 12 months. The next person we hired was a chief investment officer. I, I really was looking for somebody that had a lot of creativity when it came to structured finance. So she has a very strong finance background but less in the traditional sense. She's an energy finance expert. And then everyone else, maybe counterintuitively that we've hired since, really doesn't have any lending or energy finance experience per se, but we hired a director of commercial business. She comes from the contractor world. She knows how to evaluate projects and evaluate contractors. So she helps us vet contractors. She decides who we work with, who we're comfortable working with. And then she takes a look at projects and she tells us what she sees and what she likes. And when she doesn't like something, she works with those project owners to try to either shift them in the right direction, or if we can't get there, it's a project we don't invest in. Um, and so essentially a technical person. And then a lot of our other folks, uh, we kind of bundle in as like program managers, people that are really good at project management can develop a program from day one can stay on track when it's maybe a 12 month project. And they have some finance understanding and background, but at least for our experience, I've come to find, you know, a lot of the things we do, you can, you can teach from the financial perspective. What's a loan loss reserve? What are direct loans? But because we outsource the technical financial underwriting to a CDFI, we did have the luxury of focusing more on like project managers, program managers, people that we feel confident when we develop a new role or a new program, they can take it from A to Z and do it quickly and really well. Um, and then lastly, a marketing person, we have to self-promote. That's not in my nature. It's not something I've done very well throughout my career. And so we're just now starting to lean into self-promotion, which is hugely important because if we want to attract additional capital, we need to have polished materials, polished presentation decks, and we need to be in the news. And she's fantastic at doing that. So that's that's kind of the range that we'd focus on today. Wow, that was great, Paul. <laughs> Thank you, I took notes, furiously. Um, I'm just gonna share a couple of pain points for you guys to avoid. 
We um, were five people for the longest time, then seven. Today we're 20. Um, and it, it's, it's hard because it, it's hard to manage a lot of people. Then you spend a lot of time managing people. But uh, a couple of things that I would kind of uh, caution you is we had this tension between should we get the, the passionate advocates for climate or the financial people? My background is um, microfinance internationally. I'm Bolivian, so my, my thing is uh, eradicating poverty, which includes addressing energy. So for me, it was always like, we need to focus on the financial inclusion and that piece, right? But for Doug, for example, it was more on the advocacy, like the education, the, the more of the you know relationship building side. Um, truth is that it's hard to find people that like Paul described, ha have both, have the passion, the mission, and also our financial people, you know? So in the end, I can tell you one thing that the people that were very passionate about educating had a very, very hard time, um, like uh, using money, capital, as a way to address uh, climate inequities, et cetera. There's like this hard, like money and charity and good don't go together in, in some people's minds. So I would, you know, just caution you. I think that Paul hit it on the nail. It's, it has to be somebody that has either project management skills, financial skills, and then also, and then loves, you know, to do work that is impactful. So that is a huge, huge piece. So thank you, Paul, for everything you said, because I think that some of the the, the the skills that you mentioned are critical. The project management especially is critical. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's easy to overlook how hard it is to manage a long-term project when you have multiple stakeholders. It's just a level of organization and staying on top of people and making sure that things are moving forward. It's, it's a hard skill, um, but hugely important to what we do. You're at the end of the session. Yeah. Thank uh, you. And, and I have to go. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you all. And um, keep keep an ear out. The EPA is supposed to provide guidance next week, and we will be writing about it and sharing information. So we appreciate you all and um, take care. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you all. Great session. Good luck, everyone. Good luck. Thank you.